And it's interesting, our decision to take money was not so much about the money itself, but again, we really love what we were doing. We could really see how Soul Cycle was changing neighborhoods, and it was changing communities, and it was changing the way people felt about themselves and about other people. And we wanted to win. You know, we had first mover advantage, and we were starting to see copycats coming to the landscape. And we were introduced to Equinox, to um, Harvey Speedback, who's the CEO of Equinox. And we started to get to know him. And, you know, the money and the cash infusion seemed nice, although, you know, we had a pretty good business. I mean, businesses were making money, and, and we could have expanded in a slower way. But we thought to ourselves that, you know, we would take a strategic partner rather than just taking money. And they would be able to help us, you know, grow 30 studios, 10, 15, 20, 30 studios at a time rather than, let's say, five or six or seven a year. What were some of the decisions or initiatives or anything where you look back and you're like, wow, how is this bad use of time? Anything come to mind? Mm -hmm. or, just, or just, yeah, we should have thought about that differently. Well, there are definitely a few. I mean, we definitely made a lot of mistakes along the way. Neither of us had ever been entrepreneurs before, and um, there were small mistakes, and there were definitely bigger mistakes. You know, Elizabeth always likes to say, you know, every time we would make a mistake, $50,000 we didn't have, and she would say, well, look at it this way. You know, neither of us went to business school. It's like part of our tuition for our MBAs. <laughs> um, and that, that, that was always true, but you know, we started out in our first studio, and what did we know? We'd never built anything before, and we built a studio, and some guy told us that he was really good at soundproofing things, and he'd done some porn studios in the town, and so we thought, great, right, like, this guy's done porn studios, go do it. <laughs> uh, and he stuffed some insulation into the ceilings and closed them off, and then, you know, cut to opening day, we turned up the stereo to find like a line of irate neighbors outside of our car. Um, and we certainly did not have money to really sound for the studio. And so that was, you know, that was really interesting. Um, <laughs> 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 um, so what would you do? Well, um, you know, I find that if you can befriend, you know, local neighborhood law enforcers, <laughs> They will sound. They will come and do the sound checks for your studio later in the evening, when there may or may not be actual classes going on, and then you might actually be able to make the sound a little bit lower than you do during regular classes sometimes. Yeah, and that worked for us for a while um, until we had money to resound through the studio. No, we have to. They sometimes have to build the bridges you're crossing. Right? Yes, and we, we built some of those. Um, another fantastic memory was our first customer appreciation day. Um, this one this is really like one of my favorite. I've been talking about studying human behavior. So we decided after about a year, we really wanted to thank the people that had helped us build business. And so what we were going to do was an entire day of free classes on Saturday, starting you know, seven o'clock in the morning, all day long. We were so excited about it. I mean, for us, giving up Saturday of revenue was huge. I mean, Saturday was our biggest day. We had four of those a month, and we were still living, but you know, skin of our teeth, we were still going, you know. So we, um, we decided we were going to let everybody just call the studio rather than use the reservation system and sign up for free. We were going to do you know, big bowls of fruit and free drinks and cheese sponsorships and all this great stuff. Cut to, we like open up the phone lines and of course a million people that don't ever come to SoulCycle sign up for the free classes. And now all of our regulars are irate. Because they actually don't give a shit if they have to pay for class. They just want to be on the bike. They want to be on with the instructor at the time that they want to be on. And now what we have is hundreds of pissed off customers <laughs> who cannot get into a Saturday class at SoulCycle and hundreds of people that may or may not actually show up but just signed up for a free class because I put it in time out. And that was our first customer appreciation day. So that was our <laughs> learning customer sales. Um, I would say the worst amount of money we ever spent was, you know, Scrappy entrepreneurs, no funding. Uh, Elizabeth worked on all of our technology with a web developer in Long Island. You know, they built everything, you know, as it came up. So, you know, first we built it for one studio, and then we built it for 10 studios, and then we wanted to have e -com, and, you know, until we built this thing that was basically like building a million extensions onto a foundation of a house that couldn't handle it. And so we need to rebuild our website. 
And so we were psyched. I mean, we had a million dollars to spend and we were gonna hire the pros. And that's what we did. We went out and we hired a big fancy agency and we worked on you know, articulating our vision and our brand and we spent six months explaining to somebody else what we already knew, which was you know, our brand and our experience and user experience and things that were kind of already working on that website. Um, and then it was going to be the big reveal, a big fancy new website. And I don't know, I mean, they, they, they gave us a new, you know, a new CTO that was checking all the hardware and software and all the things that we were launching. But somehow we flipped on the switch that day and flipped off the other website. And it was great. <coughs> eight people could book the same bike in the same class at the same time. <laughs> Um, and that was a disaster. And then to make it even better, nobody could fix it. One week of signups went by, four weeks of signups went by, six weeks of signups went by. Talk about using up your goodwill. You know, the first few weeks, people gave us the benefit of the doubt. We had great customer service teams, people showed up, they gave people hugs, they gave people free classes. I'm sure the four hugs, yeah, enough of the hugs. Yeah, it was like, by, by week number four, people were just like, we were just, they just thought we were totally in an app. Um, and that's actually how our app was born, to divert people from our fancy new website that never actually got working. I mean, it works now, but it took us quite a while. I mean, we were able to build an app better than we were able to fix that site. That sounds really stressful. <laughs> it was stressful. So, uh, I don't know if this is still a thing, and maybe it was never a thing, and it's just something on the internet. 16 seconds to call. Huh. Yeah, that's how long I can meditate. Yeah, okay, can you, can you talk about this? <laughs> Um, that and any other, any other, that and any other tools that might help when you're going through an experience like that. So um, I'm not really good at sitting still. That's not my specialty. Uh, I have definitely tried meditation in many different forms with many very talented people, and, and many trusted friends have referred me to many places that I, I'm sure are the right places to be meditating, and I have never found it yet in my being to meditate. I think that's why Soul Cycle continues to be such a huge part of my life, just because there is something in that room for me that is really meditative, and to the point of coping skills, it's still something that I um, to help you to operate at a high level when there's the potential to be overwhelmed by stress. But you, you, like you said, you don't, you don't strike me as the type to sit still for very long. You seem to do a lot and, and get a lot done. Uh, and therein lies the risk of, I think, overwhelm. So what, what are other things you do to avoid buckling up your overwhelm? I will honestly say that the, the number one thing that keeps me from buckling under is that I have a really awesome marriage. Um, I know that that sounds funny or, or maybe not, but I have chosen a partner who actually um, is really amazing at communicating with me during times of anxiety and actually has sort of created an atmosphere in our home that is not super tolerant of my anxiety. Um, in the best way possible. So what is, what in the best way possible. What does possible. that look like? Um, it looks like, it looks like, you know, when I walk through the threshold of my house, you know, um, I have a partner that, if I'm stressed out, sort of demands me to communicate about it and sort of get rid of it. And, um, you know, we have a lot of respect for each other and he usually finds a way to to figure out what it is that can can bring me down from that and I, I will say that being in a relationship like that with somebody who is not an anxious person who is able to kind of de-escalate your own anxiety is is kind of fantastic. Could you give an example, you don't have to, but if, if you can, of language is so important. Right? Like the devil's really in the details. So what might he say or ask when he's like, uh oh, code red, I see what's coming, and wants to get you to talk about it or de escalate? What might be like important? just this morning. <laughs> <laughs> we were preparing for this interview. Yeah. And I said to him like, Are you gonna help me with the questions for Tim Ferris? <laughs> <laughs> and he said to me, you know, I didn't want to say this to you yesterday. But you said that to me the same way yesterday. And you were asking it to me in a way that obviously you're very anxious. And, you know, of course I want to help you. But would you like to ask that in a different way? 
<laughs> I thought to myself, you know, I know he wants to help me because he is like the biggest supporter of my whole entire life. And I'm sure that he, and I know that he spent a lot of time thinking about this because he sent me emails, you know, that I asked him to think about this. And then I thought for a second about my own anxiety and where I was going with it because I thought, you know, oh, I have something else to do at 11, and is he gonna help me at 10.30? And it was my only crazy person in there thinking like, you need to help me right now. That was like my own person. But he does not get worked up like that. And so he said to me like, do you want to ask me differently? Because you asked me the same way yesterday, and I don't think, and the thing was, that was just my own chat. And most of the times that I, um, you know, am communicating badly with him, with my children, it's because I'm in a state of anxiety or distress. And I think having somebody like that by your side that can check you like that, again, in a way that's loving, not in a way that's, you know, like that, I think that really helps to to bring the situation down. And I, and I will tell you one other amazing thing that we can do in our house that has really helped to, um, kind of reframe the way that we um, we live. So we started to celebrate Shabbat about five years ago. I was out one day with um, a friend of mine who is like a super successful music executive. She's like definitely one of my main girl crushes. You know, she's like a total boss and a real power broker. And we were having a business lunch one day. And at the end of the lunch, she said to me, you know, I have to duck out a few minutes early. I have to go pick up a challah for Shabbat. A challah for people who don't celebrate Shabbat is the bread and bread that we eat on Shabbat, right? And, um, you know, one thing that you know, my business partner Elizabeth loves, she always says to me, it's always fun to find out something new that you don't know about somebody that you think you know really well. So I looked at my friend Julie and I said, really? I said, you like, celebrate Shabbat with her? And she said, yeah, you know, I'm out a couple nights of the week listening to music, and I find that, you know, because I'm so busy, it's really, it's a lot of integrity for our family. You know, we all have to be at the dinner table at 6.30 on Friday night, and we put our phones away, and we light candles, and we don't take out our phones till the next morning, and it's the one thing that we do in our house that really, you know, reframes our time together. And I thought, well, well she's clearly more important than I am, and she makes this happen, so like, I can definitely fit Shabbat in. <laughs> And we started to have Shabbat. And here's the interesting thing, you know, we're not religious people. I would say that we are we're spiritual just in the way that we believe that, you know, the way that you are in the world is the way that you feel in the world. And I think that we believe in something bigger and that we're all connected in some way. But I, I wouldn't say that we're religious. Um, but we started to have Shabbat. And we have very few requirements of our children. But one requirement is that everybody is home for that evening. Our daughter, who was five months old when we started Soul Cycle, she's now 13, and our rule for her, she can have as many friends as she wants, but she has to be there. And we light our candles at 6.30, and there's something about the time that it takes those candles to burn that, for me, who cannot meditate, um, being with people that I love, and there's always plenty of people at our table, it's friends or family, and it's always fantastic, and there's just something about the time that it takes those candles to burn and not having phones and having a different kind of conversation with each other and just, it's almost like I've given myself permission for the evening to shut down. Um, and whatever that is inside of me that has, whenever the minute we light the candle, says like, it's cool until tomorrow. The world's gonna wait for you. There's something about that ritual for me that's really one of the times that I look forward to most of the week. What, uh, what rules do you have during uh, Shabbat, and does it, is it primarily, and what's the duration, so is it primarily from that dinner to the following morning, when you guys all put phones away? Yeah, is that, the, is that the most important rule? Are there other rules that you guys follow? Yeah, we say, you know, we say, we, we like candles, and we do say two prayers in Hebrew. It's, it's what we do. Um, my husband has recently started playing the guitar, and he's, he's mastering some guitar songs, and so we usually, if we try to have some music, he's getting pretty good. <laughs> Um, our kids are usually super embarrassed if they have friends over the their dads playing guitar and their mom singing and clapping, so it's a really big hit. <laughs> I try to buy a lot of really good desserts, you know, everything from Levain Bakery to Bake by Melissa on down to lure my kids are to stick around the table for a certain amount of time. Um, Spencer and I try to keep our phones in the drawer until the following morning. My daughter, you know, 
would obviously die without getting back on Snapchat by about nine o'clock, so we allowed her to do that. Um, and there are no rules, really. And the, and the crazy thing is, you know, it's just, again, it's, it's always intimate, it always feels like a safe space, it always feels like people can share like, what really happened to them that week, you know, how they're really feeling about themselves, their triumphs, their tragedies. It just feels like there's like no bullshit at the table. You know, people are really, for, for all the times during the week that you had to go out and pretend it was great, or that you were coming into work, or that I loved you at school today, or whatever it is, it just feels like it's a really kind of, you know, we all go by, you know, we go in pajamas or sweatpants, you know, no matter who's coming over, and it's just a super relaxed kind of just bring your best self, or bring your real self. I love it. What a beautiful ritual. Uh, where should I go from? When you mentioned the prepping for the interview and the anxiety, were there any questions that you hoped I would ask you? Like, you know what? I have a really good answer to that. I really do answer this type of question. I hope he asked me this. Or conversely, is anyone like, I hope to God he really doesn't ask me this. Mm. Um, this is a bit of a trick, mm -hmm. isn't Well, I have to say, you know, I did do some research while I was, uh, you know, getting ready for the interview, and I was really, you know, I listened to a lot of very impressive people on the podcast, and I was really thinking to myself, like, I haven't written a book. I don't really have a method for anything. Um, so I was really hoping that you wouldn't ask me for some sort of dissertation on something. Um, you know, I was thinking a lot, a, a couple of things that I was thinking about were just, you know, I was thinking about Soul Cycle a little bit, and I was thinking kind of about what made the experience special. And I was thinking about, if we would talk about that a little bit, just sort of about you know, the construction of what that experience is like in the room. And I 